Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today we're joined by Melinda Buller. Melinda is a forensic psychologist who's enjoyed a very diverse career in a number of NHS forensic mental health services around the UK before moving into private practice in 2020. Her private practice is growing and diversifying. However, it's underpinned by a passion for practicing from a position of lifelong experience being different. Her main interests are helping those who've struggled with being different and professionals who've experienced moral injury and institutional betrayal. Melinda has lived experience of autism and is passionate about contributing to increasing awareness and understanding of the experiences of highly masked, late diagnosed autistic people. And she's a keen interest in the development and application of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And we're really glad to have you on today, Melinda. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honour. Hello, Melinda. Very nice to meet you. So I understand you're from Australia. Indeed, I thought I heard Western Australia. Yes. And does that does that inevitably mean Perth? It does inevitably mean Perth. <laughs> or if anyone isn't from Perth, they'll often say they're from Perth because nobody's heard of anywhere else. <laughs> so <laughs> true. Yeah. So what brought you to the UK? Oh gosh, this could be an interview on its own. Um, I think in a nutshell, it was a mixture of uh, career development. So. Um, interestingly, the training that I did as a forensic psychologist was probably more, equipped me more to work in the UK than it did back home. So there was that. There was wanderlust, huge wanderlust, wanting to travel and live somewhere other than Perth, which is very, you know, quite small. Um, And at the time I was, you know, in a relationship with someone who's from Europe. So it was those three reasons that brought me over. And of course, I never left. <laughs> so good yeah. to have you. Thank so, you. So you worked with one of our former guests, uh, Laura yeah. Hamilton at, at uh, Rampton Hospital. Yes. What was it like working as a forensic psychologist with a plop population who are all experiencing mental disorder? Um, I think I've always... So, well, one particular um, saying or phrase has stayed with me from those days, and that was from uh, a service user who was there at the time. And he said, between heaven and hell is Rampton. And <laughs> I just, I've never forgotten that because it really captures, I think, what it was like. So there were some really amazing forward thinking, you know, innovative, exciting work, um, wonderful colleagues, very, you know, very, so much to offer, um, learning so much from the service users as well, but also some of the most difficult um, experiences, working with such extremes um, of experience, um, extremes from an organisational perspective, you know, rules and non-rules and whatever, um, So I think that's one of the ways I've remembered it. Um, And it's obviously stayed with me ever since um, and shaped a lot of who I am. Yeah. Can you say a bit more about what it was like working at Rampton? I suppose I've always been struck when going there by the fact that it is in this tiny little village where lots of the staff live. And it always felt to me that it might be a place with quite a closed culture that was quite hard yeah. to create change. I mean, psychologists all seem to live much further away. They do. Um, yes, but the nursing staff largely seem to live yeah. in the locality. Yeah, you're right, Naomi, I agree. It was um, it was like a planet of its own. Um, and so there was a real felt sense of safety in that in that respect. And you don't really realise how how enmeshed you are in that planet until you're not in it anymore. Um, and in fact, towards the end of my time there, I was reflecting, I was invited to reflect with someone I was working with at the time about the impact of 
working at, at Rampton from a, you know, from a physical perspective as well with all the gates and having to open and lock gates, um, you know, not being allowed to, to move very much, having not having your phone, not having social media, you know, access to that, which we take for granted day to day now. Um, all of those things you don't realise the impact of until you, you don't have to do it anymore. Um, so you're right, in terms of a culture, it, it is very insular. Um, but within that, I think, is a real felt sense of safety for a lot of people, which is very, very hard to break out of. Um, and why I guess not just service users, but staff as well, really find it hard either A, to leave or to adjust to life after Rampton, you know. <laughs> so I'd like to think I did okay, but yeah. Yeah, I think uh, compared to medium and low secure hospitals, they yeah. off, it, 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 it seems to share much more in common with prison settings where there is kind of like a silo culture and... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in prison, one of the things that David and, I, David and I have often reflected on is how there's not uh, prisons don't tend to be terribly outward looking, and mm. there's a lack of transparency and lots of reminders that you're going into this little pocket of yes. where everything's quite closed. Whereas, you know, ordinarily, if you're working in a medium or low secure hospital, for instance, you might be able to have your mobile phone in your bag while you're at work, mm. but you just won't be able to take it onto the, the ward yes. area. Yes, yeah. yeah. So there's certainly some procedural quite key procedural differences um, between the different levels of security. But I, I, you know, I'm inclined to say also that some of the um, experiences I've had, because I've worked across all different uh, levels of security, is also down to the culture of, you know, the senior managers and, and how, what, what they bring mm -hmm. to the culture and, and how they lead. So I think that's also quite a big factor, because interestingly, I probably had more flexible and outward looking uh, senior colleagues at Rampton than I did in other services. So, you know, it really was a contradiction at times. Um, but I think that's just part of the, the you know, the whole fascination, I suppose, um, complexity of working in, in a place like Rampton and, and any secure service, I think. So, yeah. Naomi, remind me, have you worked at Rampton? No, I've worked in um, medium secure settings, but not not um, not high secure. Right. When it comes to hospitals, those. Mm. Okay. So, anyway, Melinda, one of the things you were involved in uh, at, uh, at Rampton was the uh, delivery of radically open DBT. So for any listeners and, and for me who aren't familiar, could you briefly explain what, uh, what this meant? Sure. Well, um, actually, I, I actually didn't start my RODBT. I'll call it RODBT, so it's less of a mouthful. Um, at Rampton, it was actually after that um, that I came across it. But Laura was the one who was one of the, the people who, who uh, set it up there. Um, well, I guess one of the, 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 the simple way of looking at it is DBT is for, for those who don't have enough emotional, psychological control and, and inhibition, whereas radically open DBT is for those who have far too much. Um, and as a result of that, the presentation of difficulty for people with too much emotional control can be quite de deceptive. Um, you know, they're, they're typically seen as, you know, fairly high functioning in inverted commas. Um, certainly a lot of the REDBT clients I've had, um, you know, have three PhDs and outwardly very successful and highly functional, but internally and relationally, you know, a lot of deficits. Um, so that's been, I would say, is, is, is the biggest difference. But sort of, again, process procedurally, they're, they're fairly similar in how they're delivered and things like that. But rationale-wise and target-wise, the targets are very different. Strikes me, I mean, I don't know a huge amount about it, Melinda, but, it, it you know, just thinking about how often when people have got a problem with getting overwhelmed 
I'm becoming violent on occasion, mm. but very, very rarely. Mm. Um, that quite often those people are kind of like shunted onto anger management courses when That's actually true. they need to be able to express things much, much earlier. Yes. And and am I right in thinking that radically open DBT would be more suited for that kind of individual? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And again, if we're thinking sort of more broadly rather than just you know a more forensic profile. When highly over-controlled people get angry, they, you know, there isn't going to be a lot of shouting and banging and slamming and, you know, it'll be quite a lot of seething, a lot of inhibition, passive aggression, bitterness. Um, that's often how it can come across. And, of course, that's quite corrosive to relationships and quite corrosive to health and well-being, that sort of slow burn, you know, um, but of course, you know, ultimately destructive and very isolating for for those who struggle with that. So, yeah. So, Melinda, you, you've explained very clearly, I think, the difference in the client group or the target group. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still struggling to grasp the difference in the way in which it's actually um, presented or worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you asking, David, about sort of someone who, who, you know, someone who would do RODBT, what would they? What would you do that's different? Oh, as a, as a clinician? Sure. You know? Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, as I, said, as I mentioned earlier, I, I don't think there's too much by way of difference in terms of how you deliver it. So there's a skills class. It's not called a group for a start, so it's called a class um, where it's, skills base and it's teaching um, and then you have the individual therapy that goes alongside it which is uh, where you know someone looks at their personal treatment goals changing you know sort of key target behaviors and patterns that are getting in the way of their their goals their relationship goals um, so in that broad respect they're quite similar in in how they're delivered um, but it's simply the <clears throat> the focus is different. So, um, you know, typical or common targets you might target in, in RODBT would be um, uh, persistently correcting someone's work, you know, your, your, your partner's work or your children's work um, so that they get upset with you and... Um, Versus, for example, someone who's doing DBT, a target might be, you know, losing their temper too often and shouting and cursing and swearing or breaking things or whatever. That's a very rare occurrence, if ever, <laughs> for someone who's got too much emotional control. Um, I guess within within sessions, the, there are some qualitative differences as well between a DBT individual session and an RODBT individual session. So RODBT you know, much less focus on paperwork and sort of documentation and materials because that's quite formal and over-controlled people tend to be quite formal and serious anyway, you know, quite perfectionistic. So more of the focus is on the, uh, the stance and the strategies of the therapist being more interpersonal, um, more into creating social safety and, you know, a sense of relaxed, um, you know, connection. Um, and looking at more subtle in-session signals or social signals, we call them, um, that are enactments of the problems that they're in therapy for. So, for example, if there's um, a disagreement moment or a rupture in, um, you know, with over-control clients, you're unlikely to actually pick it up because <laughs> it'll be, you know, loss of eye contact or going a bit quiet or saying, no, I'm fine, no, no, did, you know, did you just disagree with me? That No, no, it's fine. <laughs> but then they'll not come back, <laughs> you know, something like that. Versus, um, you know, a DBT client would probably, you know, have something quite acerbic to say in the moment or, you know, you'll, you'll know, you'll know you're in trouble. So, uh, <laughs> so those are some, you know, I guess some of the, the differences I've noticed over, over the years. 
We, we've um, we've literally just had a conversation with someone about boarding schools and we've found oh. in quite a few podcasts about boarding schools and as you're talking yeah. I'm thinking actually this might well be a treatment that would be particularly useful for people who've had a boarding school mm. education in terms of the reliance upon dissociation and be, being cut off. Mm. Yeah. But but I was also thinking, I remember when DBT first kind of like landed and there was, mm. uh, it caused quite a kerfuffle because of mm. the idea of the skills coaching via telephone, you know, that you could oh, phone, yeah. <laughs> phone a therapist. I, I imagine that that isn't part of what's needed in, in radically open DBT. Um, well, I, I guess, again, the, the sort of, how the behaviour shows up is quite different. I've, I mean, again, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not the most experienced person. There'll be other clinicians who are more experienced than me, but I've never really had anyone, you know, use that. <laughs> um, very good at following rules, you know, so homework gets done, they show up on time and, you know, all of those sort of group behaviours and therapy behaviours tend tend to be fairly okay. Um, it's more, they, they, they tend to be very subtle, the, the behaviours of, um, you know, like changing the, the subject quite, quite de you know, deftly. And, um, you know, you could be talking about self-harm or suicide risk, which is actually really high in over-control population. Um, and suddenly they'll be talking about a book or a film that they saw about suicide and the topic's not on them anymore and their risk, you know, and it's like, hang on, how do we get here? <laughs> so it's it's much more challenging in that sense, working with someone with those sorts of issues. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's uh, very clear. Um, so moving on, Melinda, you now work for yourself. Yes. Why did you decide to make the transition to uh, private practice? Mm. Um, I think one of the, well, the biggest, biggest reason was I just struggled so much in the NHS services I was in, um, despite all the good that came of it, you know, all the training and the clinical experience and, you know, amazing colleagues. Um, it was, you know, as an organ or the organizations I was in, I don't want to, you know, tie everything with the same brush. I had some really, really difficult experiences, um, with, you know, trying to fit in and, and trying to, I suppose, follow a, a typical trajectory of moving from one band to the next band to a consultant role and all of that. It just, it just seemed to stall and be very, very difficult, um, despite me, you know, being ex extreme experienced and having lots of different skills and whatever, it was, it just never quite worked. Anyway, uh, I guess it culminated in, in my last role in the NHS where I um, raised serious concerns about health, safety and well-being where I was working. And to cut a very long story short, I know we'll go into a little bit more perhaps, but um, it, it, it ended up in uh, uh, employment tribunal as a result of my raising concerns. So I think the uh, in the aftermath of that, I it, it was very clear to me, I couldn't really continue working in the public sector, in, in institutions. Um, and so you know, this sort of burgeoning idea of I need to work for myself, I want to work for myself came about. And with regards to the timing of it, um, I happened to be on an employment break anyway. I was back home in Australia at the time my dad was terminal. So I took time off for that. Um, then the pandemic came and I thought, right, what do I do? <laughs> do I come back to the UK before the border shut or do I stay on? And uh, I made the decision to stay, you know, in part my, my friends and loved ones here saying, don't come back to the UK. It's gone nuts. You know? <laughs> so I decided to stay on and get my registration back in Australia and started practicing as an associate. And I just knew I, I couldn't look back after that. Yeah. So you're in Australia now, are you? No, no, I'm back in. Uh, I'm back in the UK. I came back uh, in May last year. 
after about two, two and a half years back then. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so you're having to pick it up all again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's been it's been a journey. It's obviously still growing and very early days yet for me. Um, but certainly feels all, all up feels like the right thing. Um, and I know I, I couldn't go back to NHS. I mean, I shouldn't say never say never, but <laughs> I should say that. But certainly at this point in time in the foreseeable future, it will be um, working for myself. Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear about your uh, difficulties in those institutional mm. settings. Um, I mean, obviously, Naomi and I have had, um, if not similar, certainly yeah. in terms of qualitative experience, they've been quite similar sorts of experience. And mm. uh, it's always uh, yeah, painful, I think. Definitely, definitely. It was very devastating. Um, and of course, you know, there, there is some, you know, some good coming out now because there's more awareness in the public, you know, public sphere of whistleblowing and, and why people blow the whistle and just how serious these issues are. Um, and, I, you know, I'm, I'll be the first to say my case was serious, but it's nowhere near in the same, you know, ballpark as some of the other cases we're seeing on television and everything. But the principles are the same. And... You know what you want you, you never want problems to get so bad that they get to the stage that we're seeing in in the media now because that is just so far gone you know the rot is so bad and the damage is you can't really come back from that i don't think um so i you know i like to sort of think that whatever experience i had and the decision i made was to prevent you know future things from happening certainly at least in that trust, I would like to think, um, and gives, you know, key people sort of pause really before. I would, would like to come back to that, Melinda, but if we mm. could just take a slight detour before that, but just oh. because I think it's really relevant um, mm. or possibly relevant. Yeah. Um, so you've, you've written a chapter in a forthcoming book, which mm. is edited by Nikita Shepherdson, and it's, mm. in t it's titled An, Aut An Autistic Anthology, Neuronarratives of Mental Health. And mm. you've written about your experiences in there. And I mm. wondered, you know, um, have, well, I, I guess you've told us that you haven't always known that you're autistic. How did you mm. come to have that realisation? Well, this is another interesting journey, <laughs> part of being different. Um, I never, it never crossed my mind, never crossed my mind. Um, I think the narrative in sort of my, my life, my world, my, my circle was, you know, sort of trauma, um, family history of, you know, mental health fragilities, as it were. But neurodiversity never was never a thing. Um, the very, re the honestly, the very first inkling I had of autism specifically was when I was work I started running uh, RODBT uh, in Perth in private practice, and my clients were, you know, high functioning people. As you know, again, I say that in inverted commas who were highly over controlled, but yet were ADHD and ASD. And, and I remember sort of having this little voice in the back of my head, like, I see a lot of myself in you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is very different because, you know, oftentimes when you work in forensic and, you know, there's quite a gulf between you, particularly, you know, if you have male service users that you work with. Um, when you come into private practice in the community, you know, the, the, the gap gets smaller and smaller. And so I remember that just sort of tickling in the back of my mind all the time. And it was when I was preparing my presentations for the conference last year in Chicago, the RODBT conference, and I was doing the researching and I think quite by, by accident, a lot more was being published about, um, you know, highly masked autistic people, female autistics, you know, that sort of thing. And I remember just seeing one particular thing on LinkedIn, uh, which looked at all these sort of, you know, profile. And, and I remember, it's like my brain just cracked. Um, and I thought, oh, gosh, you know, you can't unsee it once you see it. 
you can't unsee it. And I could not shake it off. But also it, it, it's, it was quite a spiral because I thought, no, it can't be. Surely I would have picked this up, me especially, you know, as a psychologist, surely I would have picked this up. You know, am I just making excuses? Am I finding a label? Um, but, you know, within a space of weeks and months, I just knew it was a missing piece. Um, all of the sort of social, uh, I guess, difficult times I've had from when I was wee, you know, when I was really little, um, how I didn't feel like I fit in places and um, at work, you know, why I chose certain ways of working and how I stumbled across, you know, a lot of the time. It all just clicked together. Um, and I just knew it. I know it. I know it in my bones. So then came the the decision of, well, do I formally pursue this or do I just let it be, you know? And on balance, I thought, no, I, I think I want, I want the formal process um, for validation, for, you know, rightly or wrongly for validation. And, you know, I guess having some credibility I mean, as much as we like to say we're very inclusive as a society, we, we're not. I don't think we are. <laughs> so I think it does help people take you seriously, um, particularly because I identify as very highly masked. I am highly masked. Um, and I don't think that's going to change profoundly at this stage in my life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's... So do you think that realisation has been helpful to you? You know, you, you just had that like sense that it was quite sh quite startling to have that mm. realisation, but is that something that on balance you feel has been useful? Definitely, definitely. I just feel like I fit in my own skin, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I All of the question marks that I sort of, you know, put further and further back in the cupboards of, in my brain as you know, queries, <laughs> quirks, <laughs> this is just me. Um, that that sort of repetitive, almost obsessional need for an answer, that's kind of really died down. Um, yeah, I think I just feel less, less burdened by needing to know and needing to mm -hmm. figure out and needing to know what to say and how to say it and what to do. Um, and it's also, I think, helped in terms of helping me understand the decision not to go back to work in institutions and complex organizations it now makes sense why i think i hit ceilings in certain things um <clears throat> and even if i learned how to be in those those sorts of roles i i sort of sense in my gut i would have burnt out and i think the cost would have just not been worth it at all mm -hmm. um so and of course, you know, it, it made so much sense why I persisted with the tribunal <laughs> when people understandably were saying, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, I wish I could stop, but I, I can't. This is so, I'm so compelled to do this. I have to do this. This is wrong. You know, you have to do things when things are wrong. Um, well, one of the questions that's around at the moment in the sort of whistleblowing literature and speaking mm. of work is about the idea that maybe people with ASD may be overrepresented in this group. And I wonder yeah. what your thoughts were on that. Oh, absolutely. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in some research, actually. I think it was University of Bath or Bristol, um, precisely on this topic. And I think it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, that, you know, the, the sort of fi fixed mindedness on certain things, you know, justice sensitivity, moral sensitivity. Um, I think one of the things that we've sort of mentioned very briefly, Naomi, is, is the concept of rules and um, how rules need to be followed for people to feel safe. And um, when the most senior people are breaking all the rules and not and getting away with it, nothing's ever happening, but you're being blamed for it. It's like, well, hang on a minute. This, none of this makes sense. I have to make it make sense. <laughs> I have to make people see that this is not good. Um, so I think for that, you know, those are some, some of the, mm -hmm. the 
factors, I think. Well, I was interested to see that you'd included that in your chapter because mm. I think actually rules are really important in mm. forensic practice, aren't they? And just thinking about services that I've worked in where actually we've the rules could be applied in different ways for different people, but there was mm. a set of rules that everybody knew yes. what the rules were and the rules yeah. did have to be yeah. followed because actually, you know, it communicates, it, it creates a lack of safety, doesn't it, for the mm. clients when yeah. you're working in services where the rules aren't followed. Absolutely. And, you know, I guess particularly in, in you know, forensic systems where power imbalances are so stark, if the rules start to you know, dissolve and there's these big power of differentials, it's just disaster went to happen and disaster does happen, doesn't mm. it? Um, and disaster did happen in, in my view. So, um, you know, for that reason, it, it just felt like, you know, I, I had, I had to do this. I had to see it through um, even though the outcome wasn't what I hoped it would be. Mm. Um, it was the process and, you know, setting the scene and, and having the, the data out there, um, you know, for hopefully never again it's needed in the future, but should it be, it's there and people can know about it. So. Well, I think rules can be really important symbolically, can't they? I was just thinking mm -hmm. about when I worked in a medium secure unit with the ward manager at the time was uh, Des McVeigh, and one of the rules was that staff can't play pool because because mm. what they didn't want though they can't play pool together they can play yeah. pool with the patients but they can't play pool together mm. and the staff would get quite aggrieved when they were ticked off for playing pool together but mm -hmm. couldn't understand that what that might communicate is if you're prepared to break this one very small rule what mm. other rules will you break you know how do I know that I'm safe when I go to bed at night yeah. you know are you going to uphold those rules so exactly. for exactly. people who've been very harmed by rule breaking it yeah. becomes really really important but absolutely you know you mentioned the fact that you'd ended up you know going to an employment tribunal and also mm. representing yourself for that yes how common is that for people to go to employment tribunal do you think uh I, I think it's actually extremely rare certainly to go all the way to a final hearing. That's a very rare thing to do, mostly because of the, you know, emotional cost as much as financial and, you know, the professional reputational cost of, of doing that. Um, that was, that's a sacrifice you have to be prepared to, to make is giving up your career, you know, in the NHS. If it's the NHS, you're blowing the whistle for. Um, so, sorry. I well, I, what wondered what, I was wondering. What, no, that's fine. I was wondering yeah. what it what that was like to represent yourself at tribunal. I was that's just thinking right. about yeah. if when people are in conflict with their managers or employers, that actually going into work is extremely stressful mm. for people, and so to then think about taking on facing them in a court and mm. having to potentially be, you know. A, taking on the, their, their their lawyers because yeah. they typically do have a legal team. Yes. You know, it's, it suggests, you know, bravery and strength in you that you were able to take that on. But, I, you know, I'm curious about what that was like for you. I think looking back and, of course, being naive about autism at that point, I, I can look back now and see actually some of my traits actually came in quite handy because I was extremely detail focused. Um, I wasn't thrown off emotionally. Um, and I guess being a forensic psychologist as well and being quite experienced, you know, being in mental health tribunals, you know, in sort of adversarial settings, you're, you're sort of resilient to some extent, you know, for those sorts of things. Um, looking back though, I remember feeling anxious viscerally, but my brain was very clear um, and I was highly prepared because I, I knew I, I knew whatever I was talking about was factual. Um, it was, you know, it wasn't emotional. It wasn't, you know, an, an opinion. It, it was it was factual things um, which, you know, I could evidence that's the other forensic thing, right, is that you've got the evidence there <laughs> to back up what you're saying. Um, and I think the other part of it was 
not so much necessarily a sense of courage that you know I'm doing something very heroic to me it was like well this is this is almost like a job <laughs> this is almost part of my job you know like I go to the hospital and run a group and write a report or anything this just felt like a, an extension of my job um and with that in mind, this wasn't something I was going into to win and, you know, kind of have a big fanfare. It's like I'm going through a process. I want to make sure this data comes out. I want to make sure these issues are in the domain, the public domain, um, so that the information is there and that's it. And that's that's how kind of concrete it was and objective it was for me. Um was it emotionally draining? Yeah, it was. Of course it was because, I, you know, I had to be there on my own. Um, you are fair game, I guess. But I do know and, you know, from, you know, from some of the decisions and what was written up about the, the hearings was that I wasn't a typical claimant, you know. <laughs> um, I was eloquent. I knew the law. I didn't really know the law. I just knew how to how to read it, how to use it. I suppose more than than an average claimant might, who doesn't have, um, you know, legal representation. So, I think because of that, that was a, a difficulty for the trust. They they couldn't just silence me or, you know, treat me and bully me and try all those sort of courtroom strategies to to put people off it didn't really work because I hung on till the end um and I'm pleased that I did because now the whole the whole thing's out there you know if anybody starts getting ideas <laughs> yeah well yeah. you mentioned that the outcome wasn't what you'd hoped for what what did you mean by that I probably should preface that by saying you know there's the legal outcome which, you know, I didn't win, um, which of course is disappointing and, and frightening to some extent, but ultimately not surprising because I think it's less than 5% of cases actually do win. Um, and that's with, you know, expensive barristers and everything. Um, but I felt I won because, and I don't know, this may need to be cut out, but I don't know. Um, before I went to the final hearing, the trust offered to settle. And the, a lot of the key witnesses um, for the trust uh, were seconded out of the service where I blew the whistle. And to me, that, that was the most symbolic win of all, is that that's, that's all that should have happened from day one. You know, it should never have got to this stage because... This proves that, you know, whoever's running this show, it's it's not going well and something needs to be done about it, but it wasn't. And things just got more and more difficult and more and more dangerous, I think. So, um, so in that sense, I always believe I won. Um, uh, but, yeah, so from a legal outcome, no, I didn't. So, yeah. Good. So, yeah, well, I'm sorry to hear that. But, but um, you know, it does remind me, really, because I think, uh, well, probably all three of us have been through processes where it seems as if the organisation couldn't stop itself. It was yeah. almost fearful. Part of it was almost fearful of stopping, mm. so it just had to continue, yeah. no matter yeah. what the uh, yeah. what the cost. Definitely. And I think because, you know, as Naomi mentioned, you know, most trusts or, you know, big institutions, they've got the resources to hire the best, you know, legal teams around. Um, and so, of course, you know, they can just sit back and be told what to do and what to say and what not to say, whereas you've got to show up 110% for yourself. Um, but that being said, what was also clear is that because I was I was on my own pretty much for it, I knew my case inside out. I knew pretty much dates, times, who said what, where in the bundle things, what, you know, details were. Um, whereas that was less obvious with the opposite team. And 
I, you know, I hold a little bit of a, maybe it's a fantasy, I don't know, but <laughs> I, I often wonder whether some of the, um, whatever was driving the decision towards the end was that what would the implications be if a young female psychologist of colour who didn't have a lawyer won her case in tribunal? And I think, I sometimes think that, I think, is is that a big part of it? Um, it would have just put a real cat amongst the pigeons, I think, because um, I wasn't in my place. You know, I didn't know my place. I didn't know my station. So I do wonder, you know, also from reading, you know, the sort of the judge's write-up of things, whether that was, was a fact, I don't know. I think so, but that's my view. Yeah. Hmm, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> just moving on slightly you describe yourself if i remember correctly as highly masked yes um is is that similar to what other people might say is highly defended do you think of the same constellation of things i think it can be construed as the same thing um and again you know th this is still a live journey for me um, I think defended has more of an energy of, um, I guess, you know, the ego being involved and, you know, something potentially more conscious and, and volitional about it. I don't know. Masking to me, and certainly as, as I've become more aware of myself, is more, I don't know, just, just seems more part of you, um, it isn't something you can switch on and off very easily, uh, particularly, I suppose, if you've been masking all your life. Um, and, you know, you work where you work and you have the life that you have. You know, you have to be alive and you have to be a social being. I think masking is 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 much less volitional, certainly to me. Um, and the more I sort of read up on it, the more it seems that way. Um it isn't a defense in terms of protecting an ego or, you know, wounded part of yourself. It's actually how you are because you have to survive that way to fit into society and, and live a reasonably normal life. So, yeah, and that's my thought. Yeah. It always seems a little bit like it makes it easier for other people in a way. You know, if you, if you're masking, you're playing by their rules, aren't you? Society's mm -hmm. rules and norms and what's expected. Whereas I think when we think about people being defended, mm -hmm. the the preservation is very much about the individual, really. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's a good way of, of, of construing it. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually um, a really good book that I'm slowly chewing through, and that's um, I brought it with me. Actually, is this? It's it's a little bit academic, but it's a fairly new and I think one of the only um, references or textbooks on masking per se rather than autism. Um, so it's it's helpful for anyone who's interested in wanting to know more. Could you just read out the title, oh, um, yeah. Melinda, for anyone who's listening to audio only? For sure. Um, so the title of the book is Autistic Masking. There's a picture of a chameleon on the front. Um, and the rest of the title is Understanding Identity Management and the Role of Stigma. And it's by Amy Pearson and Kieran Rose. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So thinking about the autism that you've been talking about, mm -hmm. does it have any other implications for you as a psychologist? I'm thinking particularly of the kind of emotional part of the uh, the work yes um i again this is something that's kind of a live process in my mind you know the formulation of it and the understanding mm -hmm. of it but as of now i think what what i well what i i think i observe is i'm very sensitive to emotion i feel I feel something very deeply or I feel nothing. <laughs> um, and I think there's been a lot of shame around the experience of not feeling things that other people seem to feel. Um, 
empathy being one of them. So, you know, psychologists and therapists, you know, they've got that, oh, gosh, you know, how horrible and this and that. And I get it up here. <laughs> but I don't feel, I, I, I guess I don't feel it in the same way. And I'm not, you know, my, my actions are then not driven in the same way. But I get it. Um, and I think I'm much more aware of others' emotions and others' experience than my own. Um, it takes me a long, long time to to know that I feel anything, let alone to label it. Um, but I suppose again over the years, and with with the help of scripts from from the profession that we're in, I've learned ways to describe myself and describe what's going on. That, that you know, it's pretty plausible. But looking back, hasn't always been accurate, um, and it's been a masked version of myself, I guess. So. But in terms of practicing and in practice, I, I think, yeah, um, you know, because of my, I don't know, my capacity to observe, you know, details, you know, minor changes, minor shifts, all that kind of thing. It's probably been, been a boon to me <laughs> being able to do that because um, it, it, you know, you are very attuned to someone in that sense, um, but not so attuned to yourself. And so I've had to work very hard at that. <laughs> Thank you. Naomi. So, yeah, just, just thinking of the time, and we yeah. always like to ask people at the end, you know, how, what, what people have done to, what, how do you look after your emotional well-being, Melinda? Oh, yeah. Well, um, I certainly don't sort of maybe drink alcohol as much as I used to, and this has been a curious development since you know, the ASD uh, stuff came about. Um, I think not, you know, giving myself permission to work to my terms. So that's, you know, private practice, not having to do anything, not having to be someone or, you know, strive for a particular role or status. I think that's been a big part of looking after myself. Um, I think being more... Uh, I guess kinder as well to myself, much kinder in terms of rest. Um, not always having to be and learn and read and perform and, you know, um, it's still something I struggle to, to do routinely, but, you know, I'm getting better. Um, I've always eaten well, <laughs> so that's not a problem. Um, and, yeah, I guess, you know, slowly experimenting with unmasking more and more um i mean maybe different in, in in this forum for example but you know one of the big sort of mem you know big memories i have is people kind of snapping at me at times like you know you look really fake you, you know smiling's fake and your laughing is fake and it used to really grate on me until i realized that's masking because i'm actually quite disagreeable underneath actually so, but I think it's it's slowly having little moments where I think, can I unmask here? I'm going to do it. And whatever happens, it's all right. And it is, you do feel such a huge burden lifting, not having to put the face on, you know, um, or realising you can take the face off is probably more accurate. Um, we must take quite a lot of uh, kind of like extra cognitive load, I think, and mm. you know, emotional burden. And we've spoken to um, other people from BME backgrounds, for instance. They've spoken about the extra burden they're already carrying by being a person of colour in, oh, yeah. in terms of going into a workplace setting. So if you then got some other reason to mask on, mm. on top of that. And the other thing I was struck by in your response was you know, from talking to colleagues who work with the NHS and how much colleagues feel that they're doing work that kind of compromises, the, you know, like only able to work with people for so many sessions, mm. having to prioritise patients who are good patients because they mm. conform yes. um, to the to the norms, that actually there's a risk of moral injury oh, there yeah. for colleagues in the NHS and maybe to going into private practice is a way of looking after yourself anyway. Absolutely. So Absolutely. interesting to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure for sure yeah thank you i really enjoyed the conversation with you melinda it's thanks really, for coming on yeah. and talking so candidly 
thank you very much for having me. It's been it's been great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you too, David. Thank you. Yeah, that was lovely.